of it all. And the people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Well, it's great to have you in church here this morning. My name's Carl and I'm one of the elders here at City Light East. If you'd like to follow along, we're in Romans 5, uh, verse 1 this morning. So if there's a Bible around you and you want to grab it or be on your phone or just listen along, you're more than welcome to do that. We're in a great passage of Scripture here this morning. And so let me read from Romans 5, beginning in verse 1. It says this, Therefore... Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. This is Paul, a disciple of Jesus Christ, calling the church into worship and giving them every reason to do so. The major theme of Christmas is on display in these verses here. And Paul writes, we rejoice. In other translations, it says that we boast in the glory of God. Now, what gives reason for a Christian to boast? Certainly not in ourselves. It's not a call to arrogance. It's a call to boast in the greatness of Jesus. His perfect life on our behalf. That is what we are celebrating today. Not that we have done it all, but that He has done it all. Amen? So great is our God. There is a way in which the Christian is so deeply affected by what God has done that the call to worship, it's right that we're obedient, but the call to worship is this natural, uncontrollable response when we fix our gaze on Jesus. Now, I know that everyone responds to Christmas in different ways. Everyone does. Um, I know that for some people that in August, when you heard um, All I Want for Christmas is You playing through the speaker, that your heart was filled with joy, right? You were excited. You are unusual, right? You are the exception to the rule. Most people live in this spectrum over here, right? This spectrum at one end is the Christmas resistor. That when you heard that song playing, you just had this uncontrollable response where you responded out loud saying, not already, right? Wasn't it just Easter on Monday? And now we've already got these songs playing? When Christmas starts building up, you start resisting. There's also at the other end of this spectrum over here, the Christmas survivalist right? Where all you're trying to do is bunker down over Christmas. You go to shopping centres, it's full of all the kids, it's full of all the traffic. For you, you're just trying to survive. 18 lunches and dinners over the next three days, right? It's just for you about survival. And so the question to ask is, how did Christmas for so many people become about perseverance, right? That the next few days that's supposed to be about celebration has become about perseverance. How is that possible? Well, I put it to you that it's because our hearts are prone to drifting. And we need to be recalled and recalled and recalled again to see the beauty and the wonder and the glory of the love of Jesus. That's what Paul does in this text. He shows us this wonder. Now, how, is he do, how does he do that? Well, the first thing that Paul says here is he says that we are justified. Look down in verse 1 or, or listen up. Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word justified is not a word that we use often in everyday English language, but it has a very simple meaning. It just means that we are blameless. It's the idea of standing before a judge and the judge looking to accuse and imply, uh, apply a penalty, but instead looks at the accused and calls us innocent. Innocent before the holy and righteous judge. So here Paul says that there is a way in which sinners like you and I stand before a holy God and he calls us not sinners but blameless. Not guilty but 
innocent. God, the just judge, does not bring a conviction. Our judge doesn't have a bone to pick with us. Instead, he says we have peace. How profound is the Christmas message? That we stand before a holy God and as unholy as we are, and we can always have moments of guilt, God looks at us and he sees profound perfection. That is not our own. Now, How is this possible? How is it possible for Paul to say that he is already justified before God when his life isn't over yet? Don't we get right with God by living a life of good deeds that tips the scale in our favour? That makes most sense to most people. But that is why the greatest reason to celebrate at Christmas is missed and most people see the great hero of Christmas as as presents and a few days off from work. Friends, there is a greater hero than these things. As good as presents are and a holiday is, there is greater reason to celebrate and it is Jesus who lived the perfect life on our behalf. That's very good reason to celebrate. Now, I know all of us will have our strategy for having the best Christmas day ever. We'll all have our great strategy. I bought my Christmas pudding ages ago, right? I bought my eggnog ages ago. Now, why did I do that? Because one year I went to the shops and they were all sold out and never again will I miss out, right? That's my strategy. You'll have your own. You'll be thinking things like um, Christmas night I'm going to have at my place because I want to relax on Christmas night in my own house. Or if you're smart, you have Christmas at their place so they have to clean up everything, right? (laughs) Everyone will have a strategy for having the best Christmas ever. But friends, if your goal this Christmas is to use a schedule, a location and a menu to secure a perfectly fulfilling Christmas, you're going to be left disappointed. Why is that? Because Christmas is not the great hope Jesus is. A holiday is not the great hope. Our King is. He is the one that brings us peace with God and gives us the peace of God that is surpassing all understanding, not because you earned it, but because it comes by grace through faith. Paul says that we stand blameless before God by faith because we have a Saviour who has done what we could not do to provide for us what we do not deserve, that is to be called his children. Now, as our culture seeks to rewrite the script on Christmas, what you'll find is that as Christmas songs are written, they'll all be about the glory of Christmas, right? The glory of the snow, the glory of mistletoe, the glory of the presents. But it is right that the church has resisted this push, right? They've resisted this push because the church knows that we all, me included, all of us have hearts that tend to drift, And we need to be recalled to see yet again the glory of our King. So for hundreds of years, the church has sung this song. In 1719, Isaac Watts wrote this song, calling hearts to consider the greatness, not of a holiday, but of a person. And he wrote these words. Joy to the world. Why? Because the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. So the great news of Christmas is that peace with God doesn't come through our perfect life. Peace with God comes through his perfect life. What you need to do this Christmas, you have to prepare meals and have to prepare presents. But the greatest preparation that we all need to do this Christmas is to prepare our hearts to receive. And how do you prepare a heart? It's a heart that is prepared as a heart that chooses humility, that acknowledges that we do need to receive our King, that none of us in this room are perfect, but He was and He is on our behalf. So Christmas becomes this profound time of unimaginable celebration, for we are justified, blameless before Him. Paul goes on. He says in verse 2, if you look down at your Bibles or or listen to me, 
he says, through him, this is extraordinary, through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Uh, The second reason that Paul gives us for profound worship here is that we have extravagant access to God. Please notice that there is an also in this verse. As if verse 1 wasn't good enough, Paul says we have received more. I don't know if you've had this experience with religion at some point in your life, but growing up for me, religion was very heaven-centric, meaning religion was all about what you have to do and not do, so at the very end of your life, you can get into heaven. That was the point of religion. I remember training with a friend at the gym and my friend said to me, one day I'm going to become a Christian, but I've just got a bunch of other stuff to get done first. Now, why did he say that? He said that because to him, being a Christian was equivalent to and restricted by doing what you need to do and not do to get into heaven. That was the whole picture for him. But the Bible is not limited in this view. Paul is so convinced that when you come into a relationship with Jesus, you don't just lay by the treasure of heaven. Being a Christian is not like being a young child in a family whose parents put your presents under the Christmas tree for months before you can actually open them. And your life is so frustrated because you're restrained from accessing the good thing of those presents. No, being a Christian is about having hope in this day. Even as good as the hope of heaven is for the, Christians, for the Christian, Paul is clear. You are blessed today. Christianity is not heaven-centric. It is life with Jesus-centric. That starts today. From the very moment you come into a relationship with Jesus, there is treasure available to the Christian in that moment. In that moment. Now, what does Paul mean by access? He says access into grace. Well, Paul is the only New Testament author that uses this word access. And every time he uses this word access, he's speaking about access into a relationship with God. So when he says access into grace, what he's describing here, what he's hoping that worshippers would see is that we are not worthy to have access to God, yet we do. We do not have, and we're not worthy to, for him to hear our prayers. We're not worthy for us to be called his child. Yet at Christmas time, we remember that the child came into this world so that you and I could be called his children this very day. Christmas in many ways is this foretaste of heaven, right? We, we call our hearts to remember that Jesus has come and he will come again. And it's also a celebration of what we have now. The Christian doesn't just await treasure, you receive it today. The gift of utmost extravagance. Now, in our house, like in many houses this Christmas, um, the gifts will be modest. As the you know, cost of living like goes up as you did your Christmas shopping and you're like, you get to the till and you're so offended by what you see that you spend on Christmas, right? Um, the gifts tend to come down. Now, unfortunately, what happens at Christmas time is we can be far less impressed with the gifts that God gives to his children because he is the great sustainer and creator and he's not restricted in resources as we are. And so you might ask the question, why should I be impressed with the gifts God gives when he is the God of endless resources? Why should I be impressed with his gifts? And the answer is because of their great cost. The child we are celebrating today grew to be a man, living the perfect life and chose to lay himself on a cross so that you and I might have great and profound and beautiful and wonderful access to the Father. So the great celebration of Scripture is not our goodness. The great celebration of Christmas is faith through his finished work. So extravagant is our access. So great is our reason to praise him. Now, Uh, Let me finish here this morning by tackling the universal problem of Christmas Day. 
which for many people will be this, unmet expectations, right? There's always a build-up for these days. It might not be as bad as New Year's Eve, right? We have this big build-up for these events and we're always left disappointed. How do we deal with the great expectations of tomorrow? Well, let me deal with this by taking us back to the Christmas day that I believe had the most potential to be the most disappointing. Listen to the words recorded by the Gospel of Luke as the angel Gabriel prepares Mary for the birth of Jesus. This is Luke chapter 1, verse 30. It's the angel speaking. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Now, the next part describes the kind of Jesus that we are receiving. It says, he will be great. And will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. This is describing a majestic saviour coming into the world. The Son of the Father is coming. This is the same God sending his son into the world, the same God that that created the world in six days, who split the seas, who kept the sun and the moon stuck in the sky. So the question then is what kind of pomp, what kind of royal celebration will happen when this Jesus comes into the world? Well, this is Luke 2 verse 6. And while Joseph and Mary were in Bethlehem, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in a swaddling cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. The Son of God came not into a royal affair, not of pomp, but was laid in an animal trough. Now, couldn't that have been delayed by a day? As we come into the Christmas, if you can just force your mind to hear this story for the first time, from Mary's perspective, she's been told that she's giving birth to royalty and she's in this backwater town of Bethlehem where there's a lot going on and not even a hotel was available for her to bear this child into life, right? And so how would we expect that Mary, seeing all that God was doing, would respond? It's reasonable for her to have a feeling of unmet expectations. Yet, this is what verse 19 says. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. All that God had proclaimed to to come to pass had come to pass and Mary's heart was full. Not because the comfort of her circumstances had reached their mountaintop, but because she allowed herself to be captured by the goodness and the graciousness of our God. That tomorrow for you, you could put all of your expectations, all of your hope into having the most comfortable day and it will all fall short. The way that tomorrow becomes a day of great celebration is when we fix our hearts on the goodness and the graciousness of our God who far exceeds our understanding. That's the great hope of Christmas, right? That today is not a celebration of of just the gifts that we receive and the holiday holiday that we have. We do not lower our gaze on those things. What we do instead is we lift our gaze to Jesus. That's what we do. Now, when people get married, often I'll sit with a couple in a pre-marriage counselling leading up to their wedding. And I'll say, um, on your wedding day, it's going to go by real fast. You can have lots of things to do. And what I need you to do, I invite you to do, is to take a moment and pause just to take it all in. And that's my invitation to you tomorrow. There's a lot going on, but the joy of tomorrow is possible Because a saviour came for a people who did not deserve him, yet he came anyway. And it would be enough if God saved us from hell and put us in a place that was neutral but far from him. But God saves us unto himself and calls us his child. Is that a a worthy reason to praise him? Of course it is. He's that majestic and that profound and that worthy of our worship. Let's pray together.
God, there is every good reason to praise King Jesus here this morning. There is every good reason for our hearts to be attuned to him. Father, we ask that as Christmas Eve rolls on,